Welcome to Independent Sources. This week we're coming to you from the CUNY Graduate School of Journalism. I'm Viano Ravinka. And I'm Gary Pierre Pierre. It's an old story, but one that unfortunately won't go away. High rates of violence in predominantly black communities. Crime in New York is reportedly at its lowest in 40 years and is down in many black communities. Still, the numbers and the fear in some neighborhoods remain high. Violence in some black communities like South Jamaica, Queens, has taken such a long-term toll that the Amsterdam News was prompted to run a picture of dozens of young men and women killed there over the years. On this edition of Independent Sources, we look at communities caught in the crossfire. What role can politicians, the police and the press play? We hear what the Pakistani press is reporting about the relationship between the U.S. and its ally in the war in Afghanistan. And we profile a Muslim rock star who's been called the Pakistani Bono, and that's by the Jewish press. Those stories and news of the week after this. A big part of this community uh, reads the media that focuses more on where they came from and their communities. Uh, particularly in the city where uh, so many people have come from overseas, the ethnic media is really important. Over the past year, crime in New York has reportedly fallen by 10 percent. But some neighborhoods in Brooklyn still record relatively high rates of violence. Abby Ishola spoke with one city council member about a queue for crime in his district. Crime is down throughout New York City, but in areas like East New York and Brownsville, Brooklyn, the number of incidents are still high. Just recently, a 17-year-old boy was shot and killed in front of this Brownsville bus stop. Residents in the area are feeling the pain. My heart is breaking because I lost my son about 20 years ago. He was 22 and he was killed the same way. While citywide crime decreased by more than 10% since last year, Brownsville's crime rate went down by less than 5%. The area's neighboring community, East New York, recorded 12 murders for all of last year. So far this year, there have been 28 killings. Residents say the community needs more resources to ensure better safety. Well, you know, you can't stop crime because that's just a part of our society, but still, you can implement cameras in this area. At least you, you can see who come and goes and get an idea who, who, who may have done this to, to this young man. We need more activities for them to do, more after school, more parks built up and things like that, more centers maybe geared towards um, them being able to uh, release in another way. Councilman Charles Barron, whose district includes Brownsville and East New York, agrees and has done just that with the new George Gershwin Park in East New York. The park was once a deserted field and an oasis for violent crimes. Now it's a $3.6 million recreational area that includes an Olympic-style track, a renovated basketball court, and new tennis courts. Councilman Barron says his goal was to renovate the space to promote a better quality of life throughout his district. This is how you say to your community, yes, we're going to bring crime down, but not just bringing crime down, we're also going to bring hope up, and we're going to be healthier, and we're going to learn character. He's also planning other projects, including a state-of-the-art community center and two schools. We have more impact zones, impact schools, you know, more police in the schools, more police in the neighborhood, and we still have more crime. The answer to crime, I think, is economic development, job creation. With the city's budget at over $50 billion, he says, there's enough money to fund more community initiatives in high crime areas. He adds, the city needs the right leadership to get the job done. For Independent Sources, Abby Ishola. With me to talk about the problem of crime in black communities is Nayaba Arende. She wrote the story that accompanied the picture in the Amsterdam News. And Richard Green, a longtime community activist and executive director of the Crown Heights Youth Collective. Welcome. Thank you. Hi, how are you? Crime has been going down in New York City for about a decade now. Uh, crime was not even a major issue in the last mayoral campaign. But yet you found some counterintuitive trend in uh, parts of New York City, Harlem, and parts of East New York. 
What made you follow this story at this time? Because we were getting so many reports about young kids being shot in the inner city, in South Jamaica, Queens, in bed in East New York, in Harlem, and we were getting story after story. I was talking to parents who were burying their children, like 13 years old, 17 years old. It was ridiculous. So we decided to do the piece. And then we had a, um, the, the poster that Erica Ford did of, from Life Camp mm -hmm. of 56 kids who, who died over the last decade or so from 3 to 25 years old. Babies, new, new fathers, teens, high school kids. Mm -hmm. And it was just painful to see all those babies and those kids who just lost their lives to gunfire. Some of them were stray bullets. Some of them were targets of a so-called hit. Some of them were um, j just in, at the wrong place in the wrong, t wrong time. And so we, we decided to put the poster on the front page and have the headline murdered just to shock people into saying, this is what we're doing in our community. What is going on? What is the solution? Mm -hmm. So if crime is going down in other places, fine. But in the inner city, there's still a lot of gun violence. Richard, what's behind this trend? Well, one of the main things we found out that if you don't put something as an option to these young people in the streets, they end up taking up the weapons. They call them tools. They have other names that they put on them. So it's obvious that they want to do something beyond what we're seeing. I, as, as a historian, I looked at the lynchings from the end of the Civil War to the turn of the century. We will lose more young people in our inner cities that it took in those 30-something years. We'll lose them this year uh, before the year is over, I mean, na nationally. So saying that to say that it's an important fact that we have to begin to uh, impound on the minds of these young people the need to remove the guns, remove the kinds of weaponries, and the other ancillary uh, things that keep them going. I just looked at a recent article talking about 10 percent of the youths that drop out end up in jail or detention. Well, what can be done? I mean, what, what is the city, what are people like you doing to stop this trend? We do it every day. We push, the good thing is the GED. You get a young man his GED and his driver's license, and he's off and running. These are the kinds of programs that we have to begin to implement in our communities. We have to take on this whole notion that we continuously use this uh, notion of the village to raise a child. The village has to step in now and start making this thing happen. Anything concrete going on besides the GED program? Well, we just declared a 75-day uh, ceasefire. We started on Halloween because that's a time when we noticed a lot of things would happen. And we're going to Dr. King's birthday. That's 75 days. We did this that's in, in January 15th? Jan 15th. Mm -hmm. We did it in 1994 when we were up to 2,500 homicides. And we, did a, we looked at the precincts that we were working in, and we saw a reduction in juvenile incidents. So we're hoping if we could keep one young person safe during this period of time, then it's a grand success. Now, but City Council Member Charles Barron is a big advocate in parks and recreation as an antidote to this. Do you agree? I agree that you have to have something for the kids to, to do. If you're closing parks at 8 o'clock, there's no community centers, there's no jobs, there's higher unemployment, there's, um, the family life is breaking down in a lot of instances, there's no income, there's no hope. You have to focus. I think it was a failure of the city government, of the national government, to focus on this issue of, of youth boredom youth violence, youth unemployment, they ha you have to give them something to replace what it is they're doing. And it's not all children, but it's a lot of kids who just, they have no hope. And it's an, it's an epidemic, it's just, it's just, it's nationalized. Look at Chicago, mm -hmm. all the kids who've died, the school kids who've died in this past year, it's ridiculous. What are you doing, why don't you, if you can bail out the big city banks, why can't you bail out the inner cities and give them something? Give them centers, give them trade schools right there that they can go to after school or during the day to learn a trade. You know, it's, inter it's interesting that uh, none of us are talking about the uh, law enforcement uh, as, as part of the solution. Uh, is, no, it, law enforcement has its place, but I want to let every law enforcement officer out there become like the Maytag repair man, nothing to do. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I want to be able to pull those young people off the streets. We're, we're going to write something now with this armory, this Bedford Atlantic armory. We got the city of New York to, to agree to put a center, to put a massive youth center there. I'm getting more opposition from even the political leadership. There's a group out there called Charm. These are opposition people, and I'm saying you have to choose between these young people having a place to go to or else you're going to have them out on the corner hanging, and next thing you know there will be some issues happening. Now, but are the police seen as antagonistic, as much of a problem as a solution in, in various communities? In the inner city, certainly, I think um, they're seen as, as, as police containment as opposed to trying to solve crime. 
they stand on the corner and they, this is the stance that they take and it's an, an automatic stand up position almost with the police, with these young kids. If you listen, talk to any young people, they will say they don't see the police as protecting them. They see them as, as trying to frisk them for no reason, harass them, and the way they talk to them, it's just horrible. Is it only young people who feel that way? No, everyone no. is, everyone is in, 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 in that mode in the community that they feel that there's that aggressive policing, but that's what happens in the police department now that we've allowed these issues to come in our communities. We have to be able to, we have to be able to take our community streets and make them our streets and safe. This way when the police officers come through, they're just sort of passing through. Right now they come through and we sort of hand our young people over to them and ask them to take care of them. And then when they get aggressive, then we we, we but what, but what, what, what Gary saying, I think, is that they're seen from the beginning to, to be aggressive. And some of them, I was talking to a, a deputy inspector the other day, and I was asking, why are your officers so aggressive? Why are they so rude? Why do they curse all the time? Mm -hmm. And you see, if you walk down the block and you walk behind an officer, you'll hear the language and you're like, what is that for? And I'll say, somebody told me one time that the, the name they have for young black kids, babies, is Future Overtime, FOs. Yeah. That's the name they've got for well, us. Well, you know, it, it, it goes without reason that we have seen that happening in our community, but how does that change? It changes by us being able to take charge of our community again. We put these young people to work, we get them out of the streets, we stop them from sitting in the, in the on the Who's top the of the... Who's the not government? Isn't that city government supposed to do that? Or well, government? government has a part to play in it, but at the end of the day, we as a community have to be able to do that also. You want there should be a code where, whereby if somebody um, does something wrong, the, st the street the community checks that behavior. Oh, wait, that's when I was coming that's up. That's the how it was. When I was coming up, the people on the street put me in check. But right. now it's something that I will, uh, you know, we find ourselves sort of stepping away from that. Unfortunately, we'll have to leave it at that. Richard Green and Ayaba Arende, thanks for being with us. Now here's Aisha Al Muslim with some other news making headlines. Thank you. Peace. Peace. Thanks, Gary. Here's a look at some headlines in the ethnic media. From the Filipino reporter, President Barack Obama has restored a White House program for Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders in the United States. The program's goal is to improve their health, education, and economic status with the help of federal programs. The White House initiative was started in 1999 by former President Bill Clinton and later cut by former President George W. Bush. From Caribbean Life, the Haiti-based company Wind Group and the Soros Economic Development Fund in New York announced a plan to develop a $45 million industrial park in Haiti. The project, called the West Indies Free Zone, will include over a million square feet of space to be rented by local and international manufacturers and warehousing businesses. The Free Zone will be located near Cite du Soleil, one of the poorest communities in Haiti. The project is expected to create 25,000 jobs and improve the quality of life for 300,000 residents. The Ford reports that more than 10,000 people have become a fan of Auschwitz on the social networking website Facebook. They're not fans of the concentration camp. Instead, they're fans of the Auschwitz Memorial page on Facebook. The Auschwitz Museum in Poland started the page in October to educate the younger Jewish generation. The page includes historical facts about the Holocaust in a photo gallery of Auschwitz. From the New York Amsterdam News, the Visiting Nurse Service of New York held a graduation for young inner-city first-time mothers who completed a program that teaches parenting skills. The Nurse Family Partnership, which started in 2006, pairs young mothers with nurses that educate them on how to raise their first child and build a productive future for their families. More than 900 mothers from the Bronx and Lower Manhattan are currently enrolled in the program. And finally, Staten Island Borough President James Molinaro and Thomas Dedona, Mayor of Crispina, Italy, will launch an annual exchange program for high school students. The Italian Tribune reports the program will begin when two students from Staten Island travel to Crispina during the 2010 Easter break. Then two students from Crispina will come to Staten Island during the 2010 Thanksgiving break. The goal is to promote cultural appreciation. Those are just a few headlines from the ethnic media. Back to you, Vianora. Pakistan is a daily story in mainstream media. 
Secretary of State Hillary Rodham Clinton's tough talk when she visited the country last week made the front pages and the nightly newscasts. But what is the Pakistani press reporting about the relationship between the U.S. and their country? And what are Pakistanis and Pakistani Americans saying? To get some insight into those questions, I'm joined by Mushtaq Yusufzai. He's a reporter for The News International, a newspaper based in Pakistan. Also with me is Jehangir Katak of the New York Community Media Alliance, an ethnic and community media organization. Thanks for being here. Jehangir, let me start with you. And let's talk about the tough talk of Hillary Clinton to Pakistan. What's been the general response to it within Pakistan? Well, in the beginning, before Hillary left and she reached Islamabad, uh, the media, both print and electronic, was full of stories, editorial commentaries, opinion articles, uh, which were raising questions about the U.S. role in that region. Uh, they were also apprehensive about the intentions of uh, Hillary's visit, and they were also uh, complaining about uh, the U.S. Uh, having ignored Pakistan and the general fear that what is the guarantee that it will not abandon Pakistan this time. And when she left, uh, when she reached Islamabad, basically everybody found out that it was a charm offensive, and it worked very well. Uh, before the, 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 the programs and the commentaries which we saw before her visit were uh, pretty negative. Uh, and once she left, uh, we saw pretty positive outcome in the media. Uh, we saw some positive commentary in, in the newspapers. Uh, we saw uh, some very positive programs on television. Even uh, some of the uh, newspapers and the uh, television anchors uh, gave their verdict in, th in favor of uh, Hillary Clinton, saying that she had uh, left Pakistani leaders ashamed because she had taken the courage to, of visiting the cities where even Pakistani president has very rarely visited during the past one year. And uh, Mushtaq, you work as a journalist in Pakistan for a number of years. Let's talk about the state of the media and uh, why do you think that the media's reaction doesn't mirror how the people actually are feeling about the U.S. even in the light of Hillary Clinton's visit? Do you think that the sentiment has remained the same? Yeah, of course, because uh, uh, the U.S. has never, you know, uh, but about the people in Pakistan. They never invested in people. And that is, that is the reason I think the people in Pakistan, they think that the U.S. In, is not sincere with the democracy, with the people in Pakistan. And then they think that uh, they, only, they only come there, they remember the Pakistani masses, the Pakistani people, whenever they are in trouble. Mm -hmm. So that is the reaction which the media is presenting. I think then that why is, is the media reacting so positively? No, <laughs> if you go to the media and mainstream, me, mainstream media, I think you can find there and they were very critical uh, articles and there there is this, this question that uh, the US once again you know uh, in trouble in Afghanistan and they want to use Pakistan and if you know uh, they I think the US pushed Pakistan in this war and this was not our war and that is the reason that we lost so many people every day there are suicide bombing in Pakistan in which you know innocent people are being killed the education institution have been closed, so Pakistan is in war. Uh, well, let's talk about Hillary Clinton's visit uh, to a university campus and her meeting with uh, students over there and the intense exchange that she had with, with the students. It was discussed whether or not the war is Pakistan's war. Uh, what do you make of that, Jehangir? Well, the thing is that, uh, you see, as I mentioned earlier on, that. Uh, apprehensions were there, apprehensions remained there. Mm -hmm. Hillary's visit remained positive. I told you that it was a charm offensive and it worked pretty well. It worked pretty well with many of the opinion makers. It worked pretty well with many of the people in the media. But if we say that it completely changed the public opinion, I think that will be an overstatement. Uh, it had an impact 
uh, but it was limited uh, to the extent that uh, the questions, the hardcore questions which people asked in the beginning, they remain there. Just like, uh, just to give you an example of Kerry Luger bill, uh, which uh, is aimed at helping Pakistan, it's an aid package, uh, $1.5 billion for, for the next five years each year, and that uh, has some conditionalities. And there is a furious uh, storm uh, reaction, public reaction uh, in Pakistan uh, over that, uh, and many Pakistanis are accusing uh, the administration of micromanaging the state of affairs in that country. Uh, but saying that uh, Hillary's interaction with the Pakistani leaders of Pakistani civil society, uh, public opinion makers, uh, uh, political leadership, uh, military leadership has been pretty extensive. Mm -hmm. uh, she did have very intense uh, discussions uh, with all these leaders. Some of them were uh, in front of the camera and some were behind the scenes. And just as the students were, were um, saying, um, is there a prevalent feeling that the war is not Pakistan's war? And what do people think about the uh, winnability? Well, the thing is that, you see, the public opinion is pretty, it is changing. It is changing. We have seen in Swat, uh, before that, there was a big time public expect acceptance for Taliban in certain areas. Mm -hmm. But uh, when people saw uh, that the atrocities uh, were being committed against innocent civilians and, uh, and people were being beheaded and then their dead bodies hanged in the town squares mm -hmm. uh, and, and that was something which started the reaction, that was the trigger. Uh, and and it causes it caused a huge public reaction. And you and think it, that this might eventually aid in um, combating the anti-American sentiment? Uh, the thing, well, anti-American sentiment. Uh, you know, uh, whether Pakistan wins the war or not, uh, it it will it will be there Continuing. for the simple reason that that there the, 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 the trust deficit between the two countries. Uh, especially both at the government level as well as at the people level, mm -hmm. especially in Pakistan, I would say. Uh, the mm -hmm. Pakistani people don't trust uh, the U.S., and, and, the, and the administration understands that, mm -hmm. and that's why... I'd love to talk, I'd like to talk about um, um, what is it like to work as a journalist in Pakistan. You both worked uh, in Pakistan, Jahangir, uh, you worked under Musharraf, and you're currently uh, working right now as a journalist. Um, let me ask Mushtaq, how is it working under this government compared to uh, working under Musharraf? Is the press really free? No, I, I don't think so. The press is not free. And both uh, the, the government of General Musharraf and the prison government, they are not uh, tolerating independent press, independent media. And What dangers do um, reporters face? Um, are they fearful of the government yeah. and also of uh, tribal elements as well when they're reporting? Yeah, it's a conflict and it's a war between the government uh, forces and Taliban. And the people, uh, the army is fighting against Taliban who are Pakistanis. <clears throat> Both the Taliban and the government, the military, they don't allow media people, the journalists, to go to these tribal areas and work independently. They will not tolerate you. And it's a very difficult time for the journalists working in the northwest frontier province, close to Afghanistan, to cover these issues. And we lost 14 journalists during the past three years in the same particular region. And it's a very difficult time for the journalists who are based in the tribal areas. They cannot report, and some of them, they cannot even write reports but the newspaper. And they have to tell other people that uh, I saw, you know, I covered a particular incident, but you will not mention my name because their family is based in the same area, and it's very risky for them. They're not safe. So it's very difficult to expect journalists to work independently in Pakistan. And on that note, we'll have to leave it at that. Mushtaq Yusufzai and Jahangir Hatak, thanks for joining us. We'll be right back. We end our show with a profile of Salman Ahmad, a Pakistani-American rock star who's been building bridges with his music.
A writer for the Jewish Forward says Ahmad's music crosses religious and cultural lines. She calls him the Pakistani Bano because of his humanitarian efforts. Adola Oladele caught up with him recently. On a normal day, the UN's General Assembly is filled with diplomats discussing global issues. But tonight, artists from various genres of music all perform to raise awareness about the three million people displaced in Pakistan due to military operations against the Taliban. The concert is the brainchild of 46-year-old Salman Ahmad. I don't know how to go, you know, shoot guns and bomb. I know how to play music. So I thought that that's what I should do. Ahmad says that the themes of his music focus on unity among different cultures and religions. The Jewish forward compared him to Bono, a rock legend and international philanthropist. Ahmad is also a UN Goodwill Ambassador for HIV AIDS. On a more local level, he's reaching out to American kids who think Muslim rock is an oxymoron. It's a question of trust, overcoming the resistance, and having the courage to act. Ahmad was born in Pakistan. He moved to New York with his family when he was 11. At the age of 13, he attended a Led Zeppelin concert where he saw Jimmy Page play the guitar. All of a sudden, this guy comes up on stage who has a two-headed guitar. Two-headed guitar with dragons painted on his pants. And I was 13 years old looking at him, and he's making these really mystical sounds out of his guitar. And I said, I want to be that. But following his dream was not easy. There was a lot of pressure as a South Asian that, son, you're going to become a doctor. You're going to become a doctor. I said, no, I want to play guitar. No, guitar. I'm going to be a doctor. Now his band, Janun, has become the biggest rock band in South Asia, performing not just regular rock music, but Muslim rock. I take uh, a blend of tradition, like Qawwali music, which is devotional to God. Take that, infuse it with the power of rock. Although he has sold more than 25 million CDs, the father of three boys says some traditional Muslims do not like his style of music. Ahmad has continued to rock on despite the opposition, and many Pakistanis show their admiration of the rock concert. I think he's doing a great job with his wife, and if there's any, if there, there should be more people who should be doing the kind of work he's doing for the people of Pakistan. He's very human and he's very alive. His favorite quote is from the 13th century Persian poet Rumi. When you follow the music, it will lead the way to peace. For independent sources, I'm Adiola Oladili. That's our show. Thanks for watching and we'll see you again next week. In the meantime, be independent-minded.